Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now a part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have two guests today. I have uh, Pierre Terrio. Uh, he's an internist and geriatric psychiatrist and a clinical trialist. He's the director of Banner Alzheimer's Institute. Research Professor of Psychiatry at University of Arizona College of Medicine. And I have Yakel Kiros. Uh, she's an Associate Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry uh, at Harvard. So we're going to talk about their research. So both of you, thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for yeah. having me. Well, good. If you would tell me about your research, what, what are you collaborating on together? Sure. So we started collaborating like a few years ago in... Um... I'm originally from Colombia, so we started working together in a project uh, studying some families from Colombia that they carry a genetic mutation for autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease. So this is a, a form of, of Alzheimer's disease that uh, leads them to develop a early onset Alzheimer's disease. So they usually develop... Oh, no that they usually develop a mild cognitive impairment or they start developing a memory problems in their in their 40s. And Dr. Pierre Terriot and also a Dr. Eric Ryman from the Banner Alzheimer's Institute uh, began a collaboration uh, with Dr. Francisco Lopera in the Colombian group and uh, with my group also in Boston to um, do some work in the biomarker characterization of these families. And that's kind of like one of the big uh, projects that we have been working together. And from there, uh, they also have been working on a clinical trial with these families for the past several years. So, so maybe I'll, I'll just add a few thoughts to that. So Dr. Quiroz uh, is actually was trained at the University of Antioquia in the city of Medellin and partnered with Dr. Francisco Lopera years ago on a number of projects. And as you heard, that there's this just compelling humanitarian problem uh, in that there's a large number of people living in that part of the, uh, the country of Colombia and South America, the state called Antioquia, where uh, hundreds of individuals carry a genetic mutation that causes almost with certainty, Alzheimer's disease to affect that person. And as, as uh, Dr. Quiroz said, at an early age, and that same affliction will be passed down to half the next generation, 
and the next generation after that and so forth. Wow. At um, what age do uh, these people suffer MCI and how fast does it progress? Yeah, so they they usually get a diagnosis of MCI or mild cognitive impairment around the age of 44. And uh, they develop dementia at the age, about the age of 49 or 50. And they progress uh, in dementia to the severe stage uh, to the uh, early 60s. And they usually uh, die in the early 60s. And there's a distribution around that. So some people actually have symptoms in their 20s. And some people have died by the time they're in their 40s or 50s. So devastating condition. Dr. Quiroz and, and Dr. Lopera and his team, they, they've been sort of trying to figure out over the years uh, how extensive this is, what is the, what caused it in the first place. It took a while to realize that it was a very, very specific genetic mutation known informally as the PISA mutation. So beginning in 2008, Jaquel, if you can believe it, we began having a a conversation with Dr. Lopera and his team, we meaning uh, Dr. Eric Ryman and Dr. Jessica Langbaum and myself here in Phoenix about this idea we had. Could, we, we wondered whether we could conduct a, a clinical trial to try to delay the onset or maybe even prevent the onset of symptoms in people who carried this devastating mutation. Uh, it was an, it's been a time lately where there are promising new agents that attack the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. We have better and better ways of assessing memory and thinking over time, even in people who don't seem to have symptoms yet. And as Dr. Kiros will explain better than I can, we have rapidly emerging imaging and blood and spinal fluid biomarkers to detect and track changes in the brain due to the due to the disease process way before the disease manifests itself. So uh, really we all were working together. Uh, the, there was an agreement in principle to try to do this. Uh, we were introduced to the families, which was a very humbling experience to hear directly from hundreds of family members what they had been dealing with. We explained the idea that we had and in a, in a series of very memorable meetings, heads began nodding and people said, uh, we believe what you're saying is, is true. We don't understand all the details, but we're interested in partnering with you. Question yeah. here, what, is, what does this population think or know or say about this condition? They've been living with it for how long do you estimate? And you know, culturally, what do they say about it? So um, when you're referring to the population, is the, the ones that are the families, so you are more asking about the, like the population. Yeah, the, pe- the people themselves that live in this region that have this problem, exactly. what do they say the about it culturally having... amongst themselves? Yeah, so uh, so I think that the, the group in Colombia, like the group of neuroscience, have kind of like changed part of the, the cultural belief around the, the disease. And uh, the group has been with this, um, working with these families for now over 30 years. So it has been kind of like, kind of like a long process. So like several decades uh, ago, they used to think that the ones that have the disease, they were kind of like going through the, through like a, a cra- becoming crazy or that they were having in some kind of like a not like a, there was some kind of like how do you say like a very like wish like what like some some kind of like um how do you say how do you say this here <laughs> like a, a a wish or some kind of like a, a bad magic or something like that happening to them I, I don't know it's how to say that. Yeah. It's, it's, so but like uh, the group of neuroscience do you, do you mean you do they think they're cursed by god or something or like they, what do they think about it back in the time that was the belief that something out of the uh, out of the extraordinary something no natural was happening to them and uh, uh, now i can say like the members of the families 
they have been going through a, a process in, in part a, a facilitated by the group of neuroscience with all the educational activities that they had put it together that they understand that this is part of the is a brain disease this is a, a, a disease something that runs in their families and they understand that when the families start having when the member family members start having memory the loss the is part of the Alzheimer's disease before we continue I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. So they now call it by the name. So they actually know that it's Alzheimer's disease. For the reason I was asking you is where you were referring to the family members, the ones that are affected by the disease. Because most of them have been going through this process of educa community education or the outreach that the group has been done for several decades. So they know. And unfortunately, that doesn't extend to the whole region of Antioquia and it doesn't extend to the whole country. So it's still, there are a lot of people in the region and a lot of people in the country that doesn't understand or doesn't accept Alzheimer's disease or doesn't fully understand uh, what dementia is, what Alzheimer's disease is, or they may not um, fully understand uh, all the behavioral changes that go with the disease. So it's a still, so it's a mix there, but I, but I can tell like the, one of the, the things that we are seeing in the, in the research, for instance, is like, they so understand that this is part of the disease that they are very committed and very dedicated to participate in research. And, and they are working with us and most of them are partnering with us to help us try to find answers uh, for this disease, which is already uh, telling us about how committed they are. What's their diet? Is this a tribe of people? Um... Are they integrated into Colombian society? Are they kind of out in the bush, in the jungle? And what's their diet? Has it changed? They are regular people. They, are, they, does, they don't belong to any tribes or anything. Yet. And most of them, they live in the cities. Okay. I thought, I imagined that these people, um, you know, again, live in the bush or something. But so they live in the city. How long have they been in the cities for? And is there any remnant of them out in the jungle that still live out there? Yeah, and no, I think that they, like the same, just to give you a a little of perspective, like at least in Colombia, for instance, when you are thinking about like, like, a, like the, so Antioquia is kind of like in the middle of, of Colombia. And like, for instance, we have like, um, there are some cities like Medellin, for instance, that is like one of the largest city of Medellin. And there are some towns that are around there, but they say like, even in Antioquia, it's not like a, we have like a jungle there. So I think that the closer uh, regions that we have, like at the Amazon, when you're talking about like in Colombia, they are really far from Antioquia. So yeah, I think that geographically, that's, that doesn't give you uh, yeah, you are a little bit off in geography there. So yeah, so even the, the one of the family members that we have that live in some of the little towns or the small towns that are not necessarily in Medellin, they are small towns, but they still they are not considered part of the jungle. And many, many of the folks in more rural areas are farmers, and particularly dairy farmers. And then folks in the city, you know, have a whole range of occupations. And you asked how long this has been, this story has been going on. It's right. actually one of the dramatic elements of this is that the team at the University of Antioquia went back through church records, which were kept meticulously, and discovered that uh, people had been dying at a young age of what was initially called softening of the brain for several hundred years. So this has been going on for quite some time. Well, the reason I ask is that maybe um, their diet has changed. You know, maybe they used to live out remotely 
and they had a certain diet. Now that they moved to the city, maybe their diet has changed. And then maybe the incidence of this has risen with that dietary change. That's my hypothesis. That's why I'm asking you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. One of the early, I think a few years ago, I, there was some word like it said, these families are, their disease is explained by a genetic mutation. So it, it has been described that we, like the larger family that we have, that is about um, more than 6,000 individuals that belong to the families. They actually have like a genetic variant, so a mutation. So it has been linked to a gene. To a gene. And some of the uh, work that one of the collaborators actually did a few years ago actually plays the origin of this mutation, a genetic mutation as a, something that was brought to the region by one of the conquistadores from Spain by the time of the, the, yeah, the conquista when they came from Spain like centuries, years ago, eh, hundreds of years ago. So it, it's pretty much like the... It's, it's the genetics, but the reason why we ended up with so many based on the research that it has been done so far, more than the diet is because back in the time, the same like the, by the way that the region is, um, the region, pretty much the, the, the characteristics of the region is like this region of Antioquia used to be an, a, an isolated. So it was very isolated and by, it was surrounded by mountains. So it was more, uh, so the community was relatively isolated. So the, the members of those communities tend to, to uh, build families and create families among themselves. So it was kind of like a more isolated community and that's uh, how the genetics, uh, pretty much how the, the mutation. Well, yeah, again, I, that was my hypothesis. But if you're saying that um, it's just this genetic mutation and nothing else, then you know, okay, no problem. You guys know more about it than I do. I just wonder if there's other factors, but if it's confined to this uh, mutation, then that makes sense, you know. Is there yeah. any, uh, are there like CRISPR-Cas9 therapies or like what, what kind of therapies does this point to now? So so maybe, Jaquel, I'll start with that. So it's important to know that this specific mutation leads to problem in, in the brain where a certain protein is misprocessed. The protein is called amyloid, and it's believed that, that the mutation causes that uh, disruptive pathway that leads to very toxic fragments and, and then sort of uh, snowballs, so to speak, that, that deposit outside of nerve cells in the brain and then in turn trigger other uh, damaging pathways. So we are group and, and many others, well, the pharmaceutical industry and biotechs have focused on this amyloid pathway and developed a variety of agents to block the, the, the amyloid pathway. And so that's where we started. We wrote a large grant to the National Institutes of Health that was awarded uh, to conduct a, a prevention trial. Uh, and we partnered with Genentech, now part of Roche, uh, to deploy their anti-amyloid antibody, a monoclonal antibody that is delivered by injection into these folks. And the idea was let's, let's intervene early enough so that we can stave off this amyloid uh, pathway and hopefully stave off all the other devastating consequences that follow. I thought that there has been many, many drugs to try to prevent amyloid or get rid of it, and none of them worked. And that the thought was that, you know, I guess traditional Alzheimer's is more of a um, insulin resistance in the brain. But I know this, this again, comes from a genetic mutation, but perhaps the amyloid, again, is serving the same function to try to heal the brain or patch over it. And that's what's causing the problem. What about other looks, other focuses, instead of just preventing the amyloid? Uh, well, I'm, I'm talking about what we're actually doing. So let me finish that and then I'll, I'll pivot. So we, we actually worked with Dr. Lopera and his colleagues to identify thousands of, of residents of the state of Antioquia in Colombia who were parts of these extended families who agreed to be uh, evaluated and have their genetic testing done although they weren't given the results because they didn't want to know them. 
we identified over 1,200 living family members who carried this devastating mutation and uh, enrolled uh, 252 people uh, into our trial. And the trial includes people with and without the mutation. The people without the mutation are, are given placebo only, although they don't know that. And the people with the mutation are randomly assigned to this, this medication called cronazumab. Uh, or placebo. Remarkably, the first person was enrolled in 2013, and uh, this study will read out in approximately a year from now. So it's been a long, arduous process. The, the, the study volunteers, the trial volunteers are heroes, in my opinion, and their families for hanging in there so long, getting injections every two to four weeks uh, for years, undergoing brain scans of various types, blood tests, tests of memory and thinking. So to, to suggest that we know that anti-amyloid therapies don't work, I think is incorrect. And there is at least a possibility that if you intervene at the right time, you're more likely to have an effect. And actually, Richard, I'll point out that a, a large monoclonal antibody trial was just reported out in the New England Journal showing uh, dramatic removal of amyloid from brains of persons with Alzheimer's dementia, as well as uh, slowing of, of decline in their thinking and, and functioning abilities. That's the drug called denanomab. So the anti-amyloid story isn't over, but you're quite right. We need other shots on goal as well, going after another bad boy protein called tau, T-A-U, so there are a lot of anti-tau therapies in development. We're talking about cocktail therapies, combinations. And then, of course, other themes, scientific themes are being tested. Is this, is this a, a abnormal inflammation, a membrane metabolism? Could, could it be that various types of infections fan the flame? And if we block that infectious process, we can slow, slow uh, down the, the progression of illness. Okay, so you're um, you're thinking that again, blocking the tau tangles and the the amyloid is you know the best way to go to help these people. Um, it, it, I think the, the way I would phrase it is it's it's still logical. We're still in a in a in a state of what's called equipoise. There's reason to hope that it would work, but you don't know, and so you have to do the experiment. You know, these are experiments, clinical trials. So. It might be worth mentioning that uh, Scientific American, for instance, a few years ago, identified this particular clinical trial as one of the top 10 world-changing science uh, programs. So there's a lot at stake. And I think that the really great news right now is that the trial enrolled successfully. Uh, retention is fantastic. The quality of the data is impeccable. And whatever the, whatever the answer is going to be, it will be clear. It will be a, based on, on real evidence. Sure, I think I'm another, sure it will be with a clinical trial, right? That's how they work. Uh, really cool parts of the story is one that uh, Dr. Kiros should tell. Because I, I carefully said when I was talking about this mutation that causes, I used to say, with certainty, the onset of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We learned through work that Dr. Key Rose and her husband uh, led that that isn't necessarily so. And a single case report has had a profound impact on her field. So yes, I think that, uh, yes, as Pierre was just saying, like, so yeah, so as part of the, all the work that we have been doing with the Colombian families, so um, just to give you like a, a little more of the, the background for this, this case. So in 2014, 2015, so uh, I started with the Colbus project that is the Colombian Boston uh, biomarker study. And as part of that project, we began to bring participants from these Colombian families to Boston for a um, like neuroimaging and for biomarker uh, examination. So uh, so we start like having a families, a members of these families coming to to here in Boston to get amyloid, as, as Peter was saying, like looking at amyloid and tau in particular and try to characterize their uh, the patterns of accumulation in their brains, especially before they have any symptoms, but also like trying to understand 
at what point they, they become a, um, what we call like uh, they reach the threshold of, of the amyloidosis or the increased levels of tau. So as part of the process, um, we identify those times, those time points for amyloid and for tau in this kindred. And uh, like at the same time, like in 2016, Dr. Lopera identified one individual in Colombia that belonged to these families and, and from the, the larger family that had the same mutation that everybody, but uh, that she didn't develop MCI or dementia at the expected age, as I mentioned before, like meaning that she didn't develop MCI at 44 or she didn't develop dementia at 49 or 50. And her family only started noticing changes um, in her early 70s. So uh, when they identified her, so uh, we brought her to Boston as part of this uh, Colbus project. And uh, once she was here, so she underwent all the same procedures that we have with everybody else. And as part of that uh, study, so we noticed that she had, like in her brain, that she had a lot of, uh, of this protein, the amyloid. So she had pretty much the highest uh, levels of amyloid that we have seen on anybody in the kindred, like in this family. But uh, despite all that high levels of amyloid, that she had very, very limited levels of tau, that is the other, the other protein, and uh, which was very interesting because that was very different from everybody, everything that we have seen in anybody in the kindred. So I didn't mention, but that's, that was pretty much the, the main finding from all the other ones uh, from that we have seen before. So anybody, everybody has, everybody with high levels of tau also have high levels of amyloid. So amyloid, uh, high levels of amyloid always comes first than levels of tau. So it was, uh, her case was very atypical because she had high levels of amyloid, but she has no levels of tau whatsoever. And uh, we also did like some tests to look at the, markers of atrophy or neurodegeneration. And she also had very limited levels of neurodegeneration and uh, she had very preserved brain function uh, altogether. And when we run some genetics on her, uh, and this is the part that we did in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Joseph Arboleda. So we found that uh, in addition to being a carrier of the mutation from the Cusinelin one, that is the one that everybody in the kindred has. She was also a carrier or the, she has two copies or a very rare mutation in the APOE gene that is a, it's called the Christchurch a mutation. And a, she was a APOE3 Christchurch a car, mutation carrier. So we ended up doing some experimental studies a, to understand uh, the role of this mutation. And uh, what we reported in this case, a report in 2019, it was uh, some initial evidence that this mutation could actually be protective um, against uh, tau pathology and against neurodegeneration, which like, like in her case, it also indicated some protection against cognitive decline and dementia. So what does that tell you that the uh, there was tons of amyloid but very little tau or no tau and that you know all the markers and profile were off? What are you going to do with that information? No, now we are testing, like this, and as I was saying, the initial evidence that we have in, in the paper was on evidence in in vitro. So now we are doing more more experiments in vitro, but we're also doing more like a, a testing in animal models, and we are doing more testing pretty much, and we are also. A, uh, from the human point of view, we're also doing more biomarker studies on uh, other carriers, like including uh, individuals that only have one copy. Like, as I mentioned, so she was uh, homozygous, so she had two copies of the mutation. So we are now uh, starting characterizing the ones that only have one copy to get a better sense if they have some level of protection or no. So it's all on, pretty much ongoing. So we will know more in the future. So it's something new. So um, so we will learn more for sure in the future. But what the data suggests in terms of amyloid and how, 
and it's pretty much something that even data from my lab with the, the typical uh, carrier suggest is that uh, it seems like a tau pathology in the brain or accumulation of tau pathology in the brain seems to be more uh, associated or more correlated with the onset or cognitive decline that amyloid pathology. So like pretty much in her case, like the same, like amyloid pathology alone was not enough to start a cognitive decline. So a, a single case may have illuminated the link that we didn't know existed between amyloid dysregulation and then the unleashing of this tau and tangle pathway. Because she had, as, as you just heard, the, the greatest level of pathological amyloid accumulation that, that our field has ever seen, and yet none of the expected uh, brain cell death measured through MRI and other techniques uh, or, or tau and tangle formation. So the, the teams are looking very hard at what that link is, and there'll be a lot more to follow. But the single case has actually uh, led to the development of a whole field of therapeutic target development for treatment or prevention of Alzheimer's disease. If you look at... Um... You know, people that have Alzheimer's, but it's not this early onset. It's not caused by this specific genetic mutation. You know, what lessons do you get from looking at other Alzheimer's patients that are different? Yeah, well, that, that's actually a great question because there, there are, you know, incredible differences between this purely genetically induced form of Alzheimer's disease, which is quite rare. Uh, all the rest of us who, who are going to develop Alzheimer's disease later in life Probably for a host of reasons, there may be you know multiple forms of late onset Alzheimer's disease, not just one form. And you were kind of hinting at that, uh, Richard. That many things go wrong with blood vessels, with with inflammation, with uh, the metabolism of, of sugar, and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if this link is uh, fully illuminated, it strongly suggests that that could be looked at both as a therapeutic for people already affected with symptoms. You know, this, what I think what we need to emphasize is that these biological changes that you can measure with fluids and PET scans actually occur several decades before symptoms begin. So I think the, the main relevance is if we identify that linchpin, we may have uh, an entirely new shot at uh, prevention of late onset Alzheimer's disease symptoms. Take people who are at high risk for developing symptoms by virtue of their age, family history, their genetic makeup, because this APOE gene is a huge player in risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it, that The gene coding for the protein called APOE or apolipoprotein E comes in three physiologic variants called two, three, and four. If you carry one copy of four, your risk of getting late onset Alzheimer's disease goes up threefold. If you carry two copies, it goes up 35-fold. That's at the same level of risk as the BRCA mutation for breast cancer. So, but it turns out that there's a type of APOE that blocks the amyloid tau connection. So APOE is suddenly turning into an incredibly promising target, as well as this linchpin that was, uh, that was illuminated by this double APOE3 mutation uh, case report. So I didn't say that very well, Richard, but the, 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 the takeaway is that particularly for efforts to try to prevent late onset Alzheimer's disease symptoms, this case could be terribly relevant. What happens with people that, um, you know, marry into and have children with this population in Colombia? What do the children look like? Do they still have the problem or does it require, you know, another, does roughly, it have to go down to a quarter in order for it to go away essentially? No, roughly half of the children of the mutation carrier will develop the same problem. What about their children now? It's, let's say, a quarter. Is it to go away then? Like, have you tracked that and seen mm -hmm. when it diminishes? This is, this is what's called uh, autosomal dominant, fully penetrant. So if you carry this mutation, roughly half of your children will be affected. Uh, 
roughly half of their children. It doesn't, it doesn't dilute over the generation. Yeah, that must be very rough on families that have children and one's affected, one's not. You know, and do they do they tend to all get testing very early on, or is that not culturally done? Yeah, it, it really depends because, for instance, in, in Colombia, we are only now working to establish like genetic counseling programs. So this form of the disease is not only in Colombia. This is something that is it unfortunately happens around the world. Like for instance, here in the U.S. It, people can get tested um, early on and there are programs available, genetic counseling programs available for them. So yeah, so it really depends on the, it's, it's kind of like a, um, required to do it as part of a genetic counseling program. So the family or the individual have access to some uh, support and some uh, resources to be prepared to uh, get the results. I, I will say it that way. So now we are working on establishing that in Colombia so they can have access to that uh, information if they want. But uh, before, there, there was not available. So it's a rapidly evolving uh, uh, cultural change. Okay, I just didn't realize it was so persistent in the culture. That's that's really too bad, you know. Well, it, um, well, as Dr. Kiros just said, uh, the... Genetic testing technology has only recently become more widely available and only recently uh, has have professional genetic counselors uh, become available in Colombia. So it's going to change pretty rapidly. And, uh, you know, uh, Chanel made an important point, which is that this is th- these these families exist all over the world, including the United States, Canada, Europe. Spain is actually one of the hotbeds. And we do have incredible collaborators based out of Washington University in St. Louis who launched a global program to understand this type of uh, familial Alzheimer's disease better. It's called the Dominantly Inherited Alzheimer's Network, created originally by Dr. John Morris. And they've identified thousands of, of, of people like this around the world and are studying them and also trying to conduct uh, treatment studies as well. Okay, well, very good. What, what's the best way for people to find out more about your combined efforts? Where can they go? Well, uh, the case report you just heard about was named the most important science publication of the year by the Alzheimer's Association International Congress last year. So congratulations to Jacqueline for that. Depends on, on the person. There is an incredibly sophisticated online clearinghouse for scientists funded by philanthropy and it's very agnostic. It's not a blog. It's, it's sort of hard, pretty hard for science news reporting. It's called Alls Forum, A-L-Z Forum. That's, it's considered the go-to resource for the scientific community who want to, if you want to stay up to speed. And uh, for for people with maybe less of a scientific bent, there is a kind of civilian's version of that that I think is marvelous uh, called Being Patient. So those are two uh, uh, fabulous resources. Yeah, no, so I will refer, I was just checking to make sure that I have the right. <laughs> I will refer people to my website. That is the website in my lab. It's the Multicultural Alzheimer's Prevention Program and it's the MA pp.mgh that harvard.edu and there we have a there is one tab to learn about exclusively about the case report there is one about to learn about resources about Alzheimer's disease resources about a early onset Alzheimer's disease resources about a research for a aging and multicultural communities and so far so and if there is anything that people want to ask that is not there, there is an option to contact us. So, like, it's a good way to, to get in touch. And, okay. and we have our own institute website as well. It's called Banner Alls, B-A-N-N-E-R-A-L-Z dot org. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you both for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. No, thank you for your interest, Richard. Really appreciate it. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.